Hi everybody, welcome to our revision webinar looking at how to evaluate supply side policies. This is a really key area for AS Macro with the exam close by. Let's, uh, let's see how far we can get in the next 20 minutes or so. So basically supply side policies are, or SSPs for short, are policies that aim to increase, improve a country's productive potential or capacity. And one way of showing this, of course, would be either to shift out the production possibility frontier or an outward shift of long run aggregate supply. I think the key point is that supply side policies focus on the structural performance or the structural competitiveness of a particular country. There are many different uh, supply side policy options. So we'll, we'll focus in a few minutes on the difference between market and government. Essentially, market led policies try to open up markets and give the private sector more freedom and more autonomy, whereas state or government intervention supply side policies are essentially about intervening in markets to address things like inequality and one or more of the other key market failures. Now, supply side reforms can have short term effects um, and long term consequences, but our focus is normally on long run aggregate supply. Many students have the default of saying that supply side policies have long time lags. Well, I think the top students would question that some supply side policies can have a pretty immediate effect. And so whilst time lags is OK as an evaluation point, I think it's better for you to evaluate the effectiveness of policy rather than the lags. Here are some examples of recent supply side policies in the UK. There are many, many you can find out about. I just thought I'd pick out a few for you. So, for example, the proposals to relax still further the Sunday trading laws and, and expand the number of hours that, for example, shops can open. I think it's currently six hours on a Sunday for example, from 11 o'clock till 5. Well, this, of course, would be a supply side policy because there'd be an increase in the number of opening hours. Uh, online stores, of course, are open pretty much 24 hours a day. Trade unions, of course, are opposed to this. The, uh, the Alliance of Shop Workers, for example, argues that uh, you know, more unsocial working would have a negative or detrimental effect on work-life balance and on stress levels. Governments introduced a whole number of regional enterprise zones, particularly in areas where economic activity is weaker than the national average or where there's a particular unemployment problem. So regional enterprise zones are quite important. They're trying to take advantage of external economies of scale and offer tax and, and uh, subsidy uh, incentives for firms to relocate into areas of high unemployment. Big infrastructure projects becoming uh, more and more important in your analysis, I'm sure. So Crossrail is, is only a few months uh, away from completion, and then they start testing the track and the rolling stock. Crossrail in London is, I think, a game changer. Already plans for Crosswell 2, which will go north-south, or is it south-north? And HS3, of course, the east-west high-speed rail link, uh, for example, between Leeds and Manchester. It's likely that HS3 will happen well before HS2, which seems to be parked in the long grass at the moment. Lots of supplies are in, uh, policies in the current in the, in the sort of environmental areas. For example, tax relief for businesses who invest in low-carbon technologies, um, designed to, to increase investment in renewables. In the labour market, the government's increased the income tax free allowance to try and improve work incentives. Uh, the corporation tax rate has been cut and it's now heading down towards 17 percent. And uh, the government also has at long last a national infrastructure plan, a range of projects ranging from sewers to new motorways and bypasses and uh, other big sort of environmental projects. So there's a lot happening on the supply side, folks, uh, and there needs to. So what are the key aims of supply side policies? Again, in your exam, if you're writing about the supply side, the key words, the key concepts you need to be focusing on are things like incentives, enterprise, entrepreneurship, technologies, mobility of labor, labor flexibility, efficiency. Those are key supply side words. What are the aims of supply side policies? Well, trying to improve incentives in the labor market to get people to uh, more people into work, for example. Invest in people's skills in a fast-changing jobs market. Improve capital and labour productivity. Improve the mobility of labour, particularly, I think, the geographical mobility. Get uh, businesses investing more and also increase the level of R&D spending, which is pretty low in the UK. On the micro side, in markets, promoting more competition in markets, trying to fast-forward the, the rate of invention and innovation, particularly from uh, sort of smaller businesses who are oftentimes incubators of innovation. Supply side policies are aiming to provide a good solid platform for an economy to grow without causing inflation. In other words, to try and avoid some of the trade-offs between objectives. 
Supply side policies might be trying to encourage new businesses and enterprise culture, particularly businesses that in the future could grow into sort of sizable export businesses. And fundamentally, it's about improving the trends, growth of GDP. We'll look at that in a second to lift living standards and also to achieve more regional balance in the economy. Supply side policies are essentially about making a country more competitive in an increasingly competitive world economy and that feeding through to better trade performance. And I think point 10 is really quite important. We live in a world of increasing environmental threat, water scarcity, impact of climate change, uh, and you know there are increasing extreme weather events. The supply side of the economy needs to be more resilient to the impact of uh, those shocks. They are big opportunities, particularly if you can get the research and development right in, in low carbon or zero carbon technologies. So supply side policies have many objectives. Fundamentally, everybody, it's basically about keeping the economy growing. The chart on the left hand side here shows GDP growth, quarter on quarter. And uh, the recession seems a little bit of a distant memory now, but you know, can can we get the British economy growing? And let's say, you know, 0.5, 0.6% every quarter. Because if you multiply by four, that would be two, two and a half percent growth. Can we keep that going? Can, can supply side policies continue the fall in unemployment that we've seen in recent times? That would be certainly helpful. Uh, within the labour market, although unemployment is falling quite sharply, there's a lot of long term unemployment. So that all the colours above the blue bit on this chart show people have been out of work for at least six months. And you can see that although unemployment has fallen quite sharply in the last three years, there's still well over, well over 670,000 people have been out of work for at least six months, sometimes over two years. So supply side policies in the labour market are needed to bring down structural unemployment. This is, a, this is an important chart. It's, it's the chart showing the economic cycle. If you follow the blue line, first of all, on this chart, the blue line shows actual GDP. I've taken oil and gas out of the equation because that output is quite volatile, as you'd expect from sort of season to season and quarter to quarter. So the blue line shows the path of GDP. The green line shows the estimated potential output. And you can see it's rising from year to year. That's the, effectively, that's the long and aggregate supply curve shifting out or the PPF shifting out. And basically, supply side policies are lift, trying to lift the gradient of that curve, trying to get that curve rising a bit more steeply so that the economy can sustain a higher level of potential output. Uh, where does this potential output come from? It comes from population growth. It comes from more people in, employed in the labour force. It can come from migration of skilled people into the labour market. Uh, it can come from fewer people out of work, people working longer hours, and crucially, Crucially, the grey bit. Potential GDP is dominated by the changes in productivity. So most of the increase in potential GDP in the UK comes from higher productivity. So if you take one thing from this revision webinar, it's that supply side policies that aim to increase productivity are likely to be most significant in increasing potential growth. The UK is ranked by the World Economic Forum as the 10th most competitive country in the world. Congratulations. Uh, and we're always going to be around 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, if truth be told. Our institutions are well regarded. Our legal system, for example, is 6th in the world. Our infrastructure is pretty good, but look at roads. We're only 29th in the world. But many countries have better road networks than we do. We've got a poor level of macro environment at the moment. Our government debt is very high. Labour market is regarded very well internationally. We've, we have... According to this um, survey, the fifth best labour market in the world. But the quality of our maths and science is 43rd. That is gold dust as evidence to use in an AS macro paper. Technological readiness, we're third in the world, but our mobile broadband speed is only placed as 16th. So can you see here immediately some supply side areas that the UK could focus on? Improving the quality of maths and science education, increasing the investment in mobile telephony and broadband capacity, will be two key ones and infrastructure in transport. Those will be straight away three important supply side policies. Well, the UK economy does have many supply side challenges. Uh, we'll, come on, we'll look at one or two of these in a second. Productivity gap with other nations, very high rates of youth unemployment. Some people think that we're too reliant on consumers instead of investment as a source of growth. We face competitive threats from all around the world, not least Eastern Europe, emerging BRIC nations and others. We have a very deep regional divide. 
Our trade deficit is pretty large, capital investment isn't high enough, and we have very high rates of relative poverty. Now, imagine one of those, you're trying to think, well, you're trying to, to depress me. You know, what is going on? Well, the, the point I want to make to you is that this suggests that the British economy has a whole series of supply-side structural issues that it has to address. That is what supply-side policy is all about, everybody, trying to address some of the structural economic difficulties. And uh, whilst we might be doing okay on the macro side at the moment, these difficulties won't go away. One of the big issues is the productivity gap. Our productivity is lower than our major competitors. This table shows an index of productivity measured by GDP per hour, uh, sorry, GDP per worker employed. So GDP per worker employed. And the UK has a value of 100, that's the base of the index. We're ahead of the Japanese, okay, fine, but well behind Canadians, Germany, 10%, 11% ahead of us, the French are ahead of us, and the United States nearly 40% ahead of us in terms of productivity. Well, there's many, many people asking why are we lagging on productivity? This is clearly a supply side problem. Uh, well, are we investing enough in new capital or are British workers having to cope and manage with an aging capital stock that isn't quite on the technological frontier? To what extent has the financial crisis affected lending to fast growing businesses who might have uh, been able to invest in, in upskilling and retooling their workers? Uh, is the rate of innovation slowing down? Is that hampering productivity in the UK? Or is productivity being negatively affected by persistent and, and deep skill shortages? Many businesses complaining they can't get hold of the workers with the precise technical vocational skills that they need. Perhaps uh, productivity is being held back by a lack of competition in markets. Is there, are there too many oligopolies? Are there too many firms that are leading a nice cosy life? And crucially, of course, productivity might be held back by the fact that our economy hasn't been growing very quickly. And so in many industries, there's a lack of demand, which means that many of the factor resources are not being utilised fully. Spare capacity might be holding back productivity. One of the other areas that's uh, mentioned in the supply side challenge is the lack of research and development spending. Again, these are key figures to take into the exam. Whereas South Korea uh, allocates 4% of their GDP to R&D, research and development, and Israel just, just a tad behind, 3.9%. Look at the UK. We, we invest less in R&D than many other competitive countries, including China. We're down at 1.7%. So we call this the R&D gap. And one consequence of a lack of investment and perhaps a lack of R&D is that uh, the British economy is running an increasing current account deficit. In fact, in 2015, the current account deficit was nearly £100 billion. It's the highest since 1948 as a share of GDP about 5%. And I think this current account deficit is symptomatic of supply side weaknesses in the economy. So if we can get our supply side right or improve it, we should be able to turn that trade, that current account balance deficit back in the right direction. The other big issue, of course, on the supply side is inequality. To what extent does a high level of inequality affect the supply side potential of the economy? Just want to take you through this chart. If you look down the right at the bottom of the chart, 2014, median middle value of the distribution, median disposable income was 24,500. People in the bottom 20% had a median income of just over 11,000 pounds. People in the top 20%, top quintile, had a median income of nearly 60,000 pounds. We can work out the difference. It's over five times the difference. And although the Gini coefficient has come down a little bit in recent years, there's still a very high level of inequality. Now, again, for some economists, not all, but for some economists, this is a big supply side problem and needs to be addressed. If you get the supply side right, this is really quite important. If you get the supply side policies that are effective, that work well together, then that allows the government to meet one or more of their key macro objectives. So better supply side means that it's easier to continue to bring the inflation down Sorry, to bring un unemployment down without causing inflation. In other words, the Phillips curve might flatten out. A good supply side economy means that you're able to be flexible. You can absorb a shock. So you're better able to sh uh, absorb the shock of a change in oil prices, for example, or maybe the shock of a big Chinese slowdown because businesses would be able to move and adjust their prices and their products and move perhaps, perhaps to different markets. 
You get the supply side policies right. You can lift living standards because growth is stronger and more durable and hopefully spread the benefits of that growth more equitably across the population. If you get supply side policies right, you can bring unemployment down. In particular, a key point for you AS macro people, in particular bringing down the natural rate of unemployment, which is made up of frictional and structural jobless. And fundamentally, point five is massively important. If you get supply side policies right, you can improve competitiveness in world markets and therefore achieve a stronger balance of trade. So supply side policies, everybody, are crucial to achieving one or more of your key macro objectives. One way of showing an improvement in the supply side, of course, is using ADAS analysis. So in this diagram, I've shifted out long and aggregate supply and also shifted out short run supply. That allows an economy to operate with a higher level of demand. So you can see, for example, that you can now operate in equilibrium at YP2 with a given level of demand AD2 without there necessarily being some inflation. So supply side policies that help to achieve non-inflationary growth. So what are these policies? We make a distinction between pro-market or so-called pro-private sector supply side policies and, where, and those which basically involve lots more government intervention. So pro-market policies are those which essentially are about cutting the size of the state and giving market forces or the price mechanism a bigger role in allocating scarce resources. That could include things like deep cuts in government spending, welfare caps, uh, preference for cutting business taxes, for example, corporation tax, um, the support for cutting income tax rates at all levels to improve work incentives, getting rid of regulations and red tape, making the labour market more flexible and making higher end firing easier for businesses. Policies designed to increase competition in markets and transfer ownership from the state to the private sector. And basically opening up policies, liberalisation policies, making countries more open to trade, more competition domestically. And also a free market approach would be to open up the economy to a higher level of inward skilled labour migration. So pro-market supply side policies really try to give the market a greater role to play. Uh, one of the aims of the Conservative government at the moment is to bring down the level of government spending, not in, not in real terms, not in nominal terms, but as a percentage of GDP. If you follow the orange line here, you can see that in 2010, government spending was nearly 46% of GDP. Big budget deficit because taxes were less, 10% less than that. And you can see that the government has been cutting government spending as a share of GDP. And essentially, they've got it, they're aiming to get it down below 40%. It's probably happened next year. You can make a case for saying that Osborne would believe that the state should not spend more than 40% of the national output or the national wealth. Well, they're going to get pretty close and they may well achieve a budget surplus in 2019. Another aspect of market supply side policies is increased labour market flexibility. And the number of people on zero hours contracts would be a, a good evidence of that. Increasing in our labour market, more and more people now working zero hours. This is where you're not guaranteed a minimum number of working hours each week. And typically, if you're on these zero hours, you tend to be either younger or part time or female, um, more than full time workers. And you can see that nearly nearly three percent of people now are in a zero hours contract, which accounts to about accounts to about eight hundred thousand people. It's been a step change, has there not, in the last three or four years? Now this is controversial. Some people think this is unfair that uh, it breeds poverty and in work poverty. Other people say that it gives the employer and the employee often more flexibility about when to work. In contrast to market exchange rate policies, you can have what's called state or government driven supply side policies. This is a slightly different approach. This is saying that the state has a key role to play in improving the overall supply side of the economy. So instead of less government spending, more state investment in public services, in education, in the NHS, in roads, in critical infrastructure, more government spending. Interventions in the labour market, for example, through a higher minimum wage or a living wage. Uh, higher taxes, more progressive taxes on higher incomes to redistribute income and also to, to fund public goods. A statist approach would have a much more activist regional and industrial policy, uh, for example, to try and attract investment into, into depressed areas. Perhaps it might involve selective import controls or exchange rate manipulation to improve competitiveness. 
And in some cases, of course, people on the left argue that certain key industries should either be regulated more um, severely or tightly, or in fact, they should be nationalised, including, for example, the rail and taking the post office back into state ownership. So that's it. Hopefully you can see here, this is a very different style of supply side policy. Here's what's happened to the national minimum wage and the living wage. Uh, the, 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 there's obviously been a change this year in the sense that the minimum wage has gone up to £7.20 has now become the national national minimum wage. But actually the living wage is not what Osborne has introduced. One example of regional policy is the Northern Powerhouse project. This is uh, one of Osborne's sort of pet, pet ideas as a po uh, trying to achieve a more balanced regional recovery. And the aim really is to try and regenerate and attract investment into cities such as Liverpool, Manchester, Hull and Leeds. Uh, the Northern Powerhouse is essentially about increasing transport connections, the speed of, of rail, for example, uh, increasing the level of investment in science and innovation from all of the universities. Because, of course, critically, Liverpool, Sheffield, Manchester, Leeds, Hull, York, they all have well-established and highly regarded universities. And massively important, trying to create specialist clusters of businesses, high-tech sectors. So life sciences, of course, associated with Newcastle, marine engineering associated maybe with Hull and with Newcastle, um, trying to build areas of comparative advantage and specialisms which will generate the wealth going forward. A big part of supply-side policy, huge part, is to try and improve human capital. Human capital is a measure of the skills, the knowledge, the attributes, the abilities, the personalities and the, the experience of, of individuals. And if you can increase your human capital in the UK, then ultimately you can become more productive and therefore more competitive as a society. So part of the issue is trying to get more kids leaving school with at least five A side or C grades, including English and maths. When people have left school, we need investment in in-work training, better apprenticeships, more lifelong learning beyond school and college. And crucially, we might also uh, increase access to digital resources, the open knowledge economy, and human capital can also be having a, a migration policy, which essentially is more generous in terms of allowing migrants who have above average skills and qualifications into the economy. So human capital is a very, very important supply side policy. Research is important. These are the top international companies in terms of filing patents in 2014. There isn't a British company among them as far as I can see. Uh, Huawei, of course, topped the patent filing list in 2014. Uh, Panasonic's in there, Mitsubishi, Intel, Microsoft, some pretty regular suspects. We don't necessarily have many British firms, GlaxoSmithKline, for example, be in the top 20, but we don't probably have enough British firms filing enough patents, and that's a reflection of our lack of research. Okay, so how do we evaluate supply-side policies? How do we go about evaluating their effectiveness? This is really where the key evaluation comes in. Well, supply side policies can have long time lags, but it's too easy at AS. It's just far too easy to say that supply side policies have long time lags. That's not going to get you many marks. The key is to evaluate properly. The time lags can be long, but this depends on the type of policy and the country involved. If you offer, for example, affordable childcare and you also increase investment in childcare facilities, that is not going to take 10, 15, 20 years to have an effect. That can have an effect immediately, pretty much within months. You know, the, the, the Crossrail project obviously has been a long gestation, but the, the success of Crossrail in the UK will actually fast forward and bring down the planning and time delays in getting infrastructure into place. So time lags are there, they are important, but don't assume they're always long. Supply side policies can have a quite significant short term effect. Supply side policies, point two, supply side policies on their own are not enough. If you've got a Keynesian perspective on the economy, if you've got plenty of productive capacity and plenty of supply side potential, it's pretty useless unless you have a sufficiently high level of aggregate demand because you've got to be able to use up that capacity. And businesses will only invest if they think they'll be able to sell the products they develop and create. So supply side policies require a sufficient level of demand and that places responsibility also onto monetary and fiscal policy. Some supply side policies might actually trade off, uh, cause a negative trade off with other objectives. So, for example, cutting top rate taxes or, or cutting wealth taxes perhaps might worsen inequality. It depends on which taxes are changed and by how much and who are the winners and losers of a particular policy. In micro, you will have done government failure, I hope. 
that oftentimes state intervention to pick a winning industry or you know, to pick firms that are winners in the future is often ineffective. You know, crit critics of intervention argue that governments are not very good at picking up uh, uh, potential winners. Another issue is sustainability. So if supply side policies are successful and you grow more quickly, then there can be some negative spillover effects. There's going to be some externalities. There's going to be pollution, congestion and waste, uh, which will require some, some, uh, some response. Although, of course, supply side policies focusing on reducing waste, reducing uh, emissions and um, reducing pollution actually directly address this. It's possible to increase the growth rate without necessarily making the environment worse. Final point is that supply side policies essentially look to improve the relative performance of a country. And keep this is incredibly important. A country can be making gains on the supply side, but other countries might be doing even better. So you've got to keep this in mind. If you, if you walk, you go backwards. Sometimes you've got to run or jog at least to stand still. So what matters is whether supply side policies improve the relative performance of a country productivity, investment, research, innovation, rather than the absolute performance. So we've covered a lot in the session. Hopefully this has been useful. Lots of examples of supply side policies from markets to government and some evaluation points as well. Thanks for joining in on this one and good luck with your exams.